Ouch! Let me have a try. You are leaving this time for emotional reasons. Well, I've done all I can do. Ex-Muslims find themselves in a unique situation even among other apostates. They do share many experiences with ex-Christians like myself, but they also face challenges unique to coming out of Islam specifically. There are certain myths and lies propagated about ex-Muslims which they face constantly, and those deserve to be refuted. Here, we'll take on four of those lies, and with each, I'll bring in a different ex-Muslim activist to share their perspective on it. They just haven't studied ex-scholar or passage. If you're any type of apostate, you may have heard some variation of this. As an ex-Christian, I hear this all the time. However, even being an activist, I can't say that this is thrown at me as often as it's thrown at many of my ex-Muslim friends. Anyone that understands Islam fully, they will find never, it. Never, never will you leave Islam. Never. Wallahi billahi. No way. I tend to think that a reason why Muslims say this is that it allows them to maintain the belief that the more one studies Islam, the truer it appears, and no one could possibly be properly educated about Islam and then disbelieve it. After all, if one can study Islam thoroughly and then disbelieve it, well, that might mean that Islam isn't true. It comes off to me as a defensive move motivated by fear. The reality is, though, that one, plenty of highly educated Muslims leave Islam, often motivated by what their high level of education tells them about it. And two, there are plenty of good reasons to leave Islam that aren't complicated or difficult to understand. As an atheist myself, I don't believe in Islam simply because I don't think it satisfied the burden of proof for its claim that there is an omnipotent, omniscient, omnibenevolent God in existence. A lot of ex-Muslim atheists disbelieve for that same reason as well. Other common, simple reasons for disbelieving Islam include it conflicts with science in positing that all of humanity came from two people, Adam and Eve. There's no proof of its supposed miracles. Muhammad apparently split the moon in half, but there's no evidence that that ever happened. Islam claims to have a perfect system of morality under which everyone thrives, but the Quran endorses a man beating his wife for disobeying him. Muhammad was supposedly the perfect moral role model, but he consummated his marriage to a nine-year-old child. It doesn't take much to understand why all of those things are a problem for a supposedly perfect religion. Finally, I'll have Imtiaz Shams weigh in on this, but before I do, let me remind you that many Muslims demand that all ex-Muslims have an extremely high level of education before leaving Islam, but require basically no education of new converts. All they have to do is say they believe it, say the Shahada. Something that I really hate is this idea that you have to have like a PhD and a, and a certificate from Azhar University at Egypt to be an ex-Muslim. It's so common and it's ridiculous because often what I'll say back to them is, okay, cool, let's talk about Mormonism. What do you know about Mormonism? And mostly Muslims have no clue about Mormonism, Joseph Smith, the Book of Mormon, but yet they don't believe in Mormonism. So I always say, well, why are you not a Mormon? Uh, and if they have any arguments, I say, well, no, you don't have a PhD in Mormonism. So it's, it's like people don't understand, it doesn't click in their head that leaving Islam doesn't require an in-depth knowledge uh, base of Islam. That said, a lot of ex-Muslims that leave actually do know a lot about Islam. In fact, often when you speak to them, they've done more research about it than a lot of Muslims who practice. You know, you've got Muslims who kind of like were born into it, so they kind of, you know, practice here and there, they do the rituals. They don't know much about it. They don't even speak Arabic a lot of the times. While ex-Muslims, a lot of times, because it's something that's so big that you're leaving, you end up digging in deep. So in my case, for example, I grew up in an extremely religious environment. I was, you know, going to a mosque like all the time. I've been fasting since I was seven years old. So it's like, it was a big part of my life. So I didn't leave it without lack of knowledge. Um, But that stereotype is wrong as well. Just because someone leaves it, if they don't agree with it doesn't mean they have to have a PhD in it, you know? So I would say if that's the stereotype you have, I'd recommend either you understand that it's wrong or you do a PhD in every single religion in the world so that you can actually say that you're not a Christian or a Hindu or a Buddhist. They just want attention or they would leave quietly. Apparently, true ex-Muslims would never care about speaking against Islam. They would just leave it and never talk about it again. After all, when your entire life is forced to radically change by a shift in your worldview, you've been taught to be paralyzed by the fear of hellfire for disbelieving, and most of your friends and family see people like you as mortal enemies, your first instinct is obviously to get over it and just move on immediately.
No, getting positive attention to stroke one's own ego is not the point of speaking out publicly for really any ex-Muslim. People are shunned, made homeless, imprisoned, or even killed for being apostates. There are 13 countries in the world, all Islamic, which punish apostasy by death. It's incredibly easy to see with the slightest bit of empathy that ex-Muslims might have reasons for speaking out which have nothing to do with them being praised. Many in that community want nothing but to be themselves and live. Consider that maybe ex-Muslims speak out against Islam because they feel it oppresses women. Maybe they speak out against it because it motivates their own families to disown them. Maybe it's because it prompts governments to execute those who believe differently. Maybe ex-Muslims stick together and praise each other because no one else will do that for them. Supporting Islamic doctrine and then claiming ex-Muslims just want attention is like cheering for a family to be ripped apart and then mocking the most isolated member of that family just for trying to pick themselves up again. Now, to give her perspective as an ex-Muslim who is charged with this accusation constantly, here's Zara Kay. What kind of attention are we talking about? Most of it has always been negative and a backlash. I think more often we have a lot to lose than we have gained with that attention. Um, a lot of times our families are the ones to shun us away, our friends don't talk to us. It's not the right kind of attention that we even get, it's mostly negative and it's toxic. Just even in the online world or even in person, people just have this vile idea of what ex-Muslims are like. Most people when they come out it is to find other people like them, to find a community versus actually that attention that they get. Sure, if I see another ex-Muslim tweeting that she's an ex-Muslim and she just came out, I'm gonna go out there and celebrate and make sure she's okay because I know how hard it is. So I guess in that way, ex-Muslims do give other ex-Muslims that attention and comfort and be their family. For us, it's mostly about building a community and supporting each other. They left so they could get fame and money. This accusation is just slightly different from the last, but my friends and I had to include it because it's so common and so absurd. To think that there's more money involved in being an ex-Muslim than in being an evangelist for Islam ignores clear evidence to the contrary. The ludicrously popular Zakir Naik sells out arenas for his preaching. He has his own TV network called Peace TV. Even on a totally different level of exposure, the pattern is still clear. Ali Dawa and Mohammed Hijab, both apologists and YouTubers, have run several extremely successful giving campaigns in recent years. One example is that in a singular campaign in 2018, they raised over 25,000 British pounds for their own ministry. In the same year, my activist friends and I, including many ex-Muslims, raised money for ex-Muslims of North America, and we raised $5,000. Also, if I'm not mistaken, didn't both Ali Dawa and Mohammed Hijab just make multiple videos a couple months ago about a family using Islam to make money? We are absolutely sure that he apostated from the religion of Islam at least one time. At the same time, of course, he's profiting from Islam and from Muslims. Yes, he's profiting from Islam and he's profiting from Muslims, doing Rukia services, 300 pounds, 400 pounds. Well, are you a crook? Meanwhile, the only person I can think of who probably makes a pretty significant amount of money off of speaking up as an ex-Muslim is Ayan Hirsi Ali, but that comes at the cost of her being able to live any sort of normal life. She constantly receives death threats and can't travel anywhere without bodyguards. I highly doubt any amount of money could make that worth it for her. She probably just speaks up for other reasons. As for lesser-known activists, there's basically no money involved. I know this because my platform and income when speaking against Islam online is a, it's a good deal larger than most ex-Muslims. And guess what? It's really not that great. I make YouTube videos full time and if I only made videos about Islam, my channel would probably either get fully demonetized, I'd make nothing, or I wouldn't be able to make enough to even consider this a job. My point in all of this is not to accuse any of the people I've mentioned of unethically profiteering off of Islam or their ministries, or to paint ex-Muslims as morally superior. All I mean to demonstrate is that much of the time, money and recognition is not easily found in speaking against Islam, and that it might actually be more easily found in speaking for it. To give her perspective on this, here's Marwa, aka Mimsy Vids. I get told all the time that I am openly an ex-Muslim because of fame and money and that's basically 
why I want to do it, but it's actually the complete opposite. Firstly, there's actually no money in this. I don't know why they have this impression uh, that I'm like working for the Jews or the Zionists or something like that. There's absolutely no money in being an ex-Muslim. No one wants to stand by you. In fact, we are opposed by everyone um, because it's too controversial. Um, and the fame, it's again, it's the complete opposite. If anyone does recognize us, it's usually for negative reasons. Um, and the amount of hate we get um, completely trumps any sort of positive fame that we might get or that people expect we would get. Most of the time, Muslims that leave their religion become shunned by their families and don't actually have anyone to stand by them. And they actually have to go to organizations and get help because it's such a traumatizing experience to be abandoned by everyone. So to say that I'm doing it for fame or money or power or anything positive in that way, it's always the complete opposite of what an ex-Muslim actually experiences. They leave to gain acceptance from white or Western people. This takes a complex issue having nothing to do with race and oversimplifies it into an issue that's only about race. Having come out of my family's fundamentalist Christianity, I've seen how difficult it is for some people to accept that their loved ones have made a calm, rational decision on leaving religion rather than a frantic emotional one. However hard it is, though, there's no excuse for hearing someone's reasons for leaving religion, refusing to believe them, and then completely fabricating different reasons why you think they left. If someone tells you about the scientific, moral, or philosophical reasons they left Islam, and you then posit that they just left to please white people, or anyone else really, you're not listening. If someone leaves or joins a religion just because of some kind of racial pressure, that is a problem. That person has probably been unethically coerced. If you agree, realize that coercion can go either way. People shouldn't leave Islam to please or fit in with another race. Likewise, though, no one should ever be pressured to be Muslim to please or fit in with their own. Walid from the channel Vidu Vids asked to speak on this subject, and I think his input is vital to this conversation. One of the main criticisms that I receive personally is that you only left Islam to please white people. Firstly, that is actually quite a racist statement to make and it's actually completely incorrect. Thinking for yourself, studying and analyzing the data and information is something which every human being should do, not only with religion, but with any given subject. Why is it that if I come to a different conclusion to you, I am now trying to please the white man, trying to please my white masters? If anything, this is quite a colonial way of thinking. And the people that actually make these kind of statements are themselves in a colonial mindset that they still view the white man, the white, the white people, white countries as their masters and they can't agree with them. Firstly, white people are Muslims, are Christians, are atheists. White people disagree on many different issues. White people don't have one way of thinking. Secondly, people from brown or black backgrounds can also disagree and come to their own conclusions. Thinking for yourself is not a white thing, it's not a European thing. Thinking for yourself is something which everyone should do and should not be seen as white or black or colonial or slave. Think for yourself, guys. Anytime I speak on misconceptions about any group, be it ex-Christians, ex-Muslims, or atheists in general, I identify the root of the problem as a lack of empathy. I think that still stands here. Whatever your motivation, whether you want to support ex-Muslims, simply understand them, or even lead them back to Islam, the only way forward for you is to hear them out. If you care about anything more than stroking your ego by mocking them or putting them down, then take this recommendation to heart. Set your preconceptions aside and just listen. Thanks for watching. I've been Drew of Genetically Modified Skeptic. A huge thank you to all my friends who joined me in this video. You can find links to all of their channels and social media in the description. I highly recommend following and supporting in whatever way you can every one of them. As always, go ahead and subscribe, check out my Patreon, follow me on Twitter and Facebook at GM Skeptic, join my Discord, and until next time, stay skeptical.